In this video we're going to prove some results which are useful for finding dimensions of vector spaces and for saying something about the dimensions of subspaces of vector spaces. The first result says that if you have a vector space of dimension n then any sequence of elements of v which is, has length bigger than n is linearly dependent. In order to prove it we're going to use this theorem from lecture 52 which I've copied at the bottom here which says that if you have a vector space and you have a sequence of vectors which spans v and a sequence which is linearly independent then the size of the spanning sequence is greater than or equal to the size of the line linearly independent sequence. Let's now prove this result. So in the result we have a sequence of elements whose length is larger than the dimension of the vector space that they belong to and our job is to prove that that sequence must be linearly dependent. In the notation of the theorem, the dimension of the vector space V is lowercase n. That means that it has a basis of size n. And a basis is, in particular, a spanning set. Then the theorem, which I've copied at the bottom there, tells us that any linearly independent sequence in V has size less than or equal to n. So the sequence v1 up to vn, which has length larger than lowercase n, is linearly dependent. And that's it. That's all we need to do for our proof. So actually, let's just think about what this is telling us. Um, for example, If you have any four vectors in R cubed, then they must be linearly dependent. So if you write down four height three column vectors with real entries, then they must be linearly dependent no matter what they are. And similarly, any three vectors in, let's say, C squared, height two column vectors with complex entries, they must be linearly dependent. So this is a very theorem, very useful theorem to know when you're trying to decide whether or not a given sequence of vectors is or is not linearly dependent. Next, we're going to prove a result about dimensions of subspaces. Part of the point of introducing the dimension of a vector space was as a measure of how large that vector space was. And the dimension wouldn't be a very good measure of how large a vector space was if you could have a subspace whose dimension was larger than the thing it was a subspace of. This proposition tells us that that cannot happen. In particular, what it says is that if you have a subspace U of a vector space V, then point 1, the dimension of U is less than or equal to the dimension of V. And point 2, if they have the same dimension, then actually U is equal to V. On our way to proving this, we'll need two results from previous lectures. First of all, the extension lemma from lecture 54, 
And secondly, the result which we already used on the previous slide from lecture 52. I've copied both of those at the bottom because we're going to use them in the course of our proof. So here's the proof of part one. We will let uh, u1 up to um be a basis of the subspace u. We're now going to write down a basis of v. Let's say v1 up to vn be a basis of v. Okay, our job is to show that m is less than or equal to n. But now we just observe that the basis of u is a linearly independent set or linearly independent sequence of elements of V. U is a subset of V, so I'm, I can consider these elements of the basis of U to be elements of V. And in particular, they're linearly independent because they form part of a basis of U. And our basis of V is a spanning set, in particular, for V. OK, so by the theorem at the bottom of the slide, uh, this is the theorem from lecture 52. We called, we called it Steinitz exchange. Uh, what we have is that the size of the spanning sequence, which is n, is greater than or equal to the size of the linearly independent sequence, which was m. OK. The n and the m are the opposite way round to how they're written in the theorem, but this is the correct way round. So um, what it tells us is that m is less than or equal to n here, so the dimension of u is the dimension of, is less than or equal to the dimension of v. Uh, part two. We have to show that if u is a subspace of v and the dimension of u is equal to the dimension of v, then actually u equals v. So let's suppose this happens. And we'll suppose for a contradiction that u is not equal to v, so it's a proper subset of v. Well, in that case, there is an element of v which is not in u, so let's give that a name. Then there exists. v, an element of v, which is in v, but not in u. Now by the extension lemma, Actually, let's write this slightly more carefully. So what do we now know? We know v is not in u, and we know that u is the span of its basis. I will keep the same notation that we used in part one, so u1 up to um. So I really mean the same thing that I did up here, the basis of u. So, of course, that should say v is not in u, which is the span of u1 up to um. Okay, then the extension lemma says, 
u1, u2, up to um, followed by v, is linearly independent. But we're assuming for our contradiction that the dimension of u is equal to the dimension of v. So this sequence, u1 up to um followed by v, is a sequence of elements of v longer than the dimension of v. It's the dimension of v plus 1, in fact. Now, by the result on the previous slide, it is linearly dependent. OK, we now have a contradiction, because on one hand, the extension lemma says that this sequence should be linearly independent. And on the other hand, by the result from the previous slide, it should be linearly dependent. So we have a contradiction. OK, our assumption was that u was a proper subset of v, and therefore that can't be the case, so u must actually be equal to v. All right, moving on to our final result then. Um, the final result is about a relationship between the sum, the dimension of the sum of two subspaces and the dimension of their intersection. This should remind you of a result which we know about finite sets. So if, let's say, A and B are finite sets, then you'll remember that we proved, or at least we discussed the fact that the size of the union of um, A and B is the size of A plus the size of B minus the size of A intersect B. And this is a very similar result for dimensions of vector spaces. Only instead of union, we've got sum. And instead of size, we've got dimension. So actually, one of the really interesting things about the theory of finite dimensional vector spaces is that you know for finite sets, there's a version of this result about how big is the union of two sets, which works for three sets. It's called the inclusion-exclusion principle, and it was um, briefly mentioned on your first coursework. But for vector spaces, you can't generalize this to three or more subspaces. So something slightly different happens. Anyway, let's try and prove this theorem about the dimension of the sum of two subspaces. So what it says precisely is that if you have a vector space V, and if you have two subspaces X and Y of V, then the dimension of X plus Y is equal to the dimension of X plus the dimension of Y minus the dimension of the intersection of X and Y. And you'll remember that we proved that if X and Y are subspaces, then their intersection and their sum is again a subspace. So this really does make sense. Uh, it really does make sense to talk about the dimension of X intersect Y or X plus Y. And again, during the proof, we'll need the proposition which I've written at the bottom here about extending to a basis. So let's do the proof now. In order to do the proof, we're going to start with a basis of X intersect Y. So let's let Z1 up to ZK be a basis of X intersect Y. We're going to use the extension uh, result, which I've written at the bottom of the screen there. And we can do that because Let's think about z1 up to zk. They are, are elements of x, because they're elements of x intersect y. So they form a linearly independent sequence of elements in x. 
So we can extend them using the proposition to a basis of x. So extending just means adding something on the end. So there is a basis, z1 up to zk, and then let's say x1 up to xl of x. And again, the reason we can do that is because these elements z1 up to zk, they belong to x because they belong to x intersect y. So they are a linearly independent set inside x. So by the proposition, there's a basis of x containing z1 up to zk, which we can write like this. And for the same reason, there is a basis z1 up to zk followed by y1 up to ym of y. Now I claim that the following thing is a basis of x plus y. So I claim that the sequence z1 up to zk, then x1 up to xl, then y1 up to ym is a basis of x plus y. If I've proved this, and I'm going to prove it in a moment, but let's just see why I want this to be true. If we prove this, then it proves the result that we're trying to um, that we're trying to prove, because dim x plus y would be equal to k plus l plus m. That's the length of this sequence, and dim x plus dim y minus dim x intersect y would be, well, the dimension of x would be k plus l. The dimension of y would be k plus m. And the dimension of x intersect y is k. So what have you got there? You've got k plus l plus m. So both the dimension of x plus y and the right-hand side of that equation will be equal to k plus l plus m. So they're the same. And proving that this thing really is a basis of x plus y gives us what we want. So that's all we need to do then to prove that this set which I've written down, this sequence which I've written down, is a basis of x plus y. To prove something as a basis, you have to prove that it is linearly independent and a spanning set. So let's first of all do spanning. I have to show that every element of x plus y is a linear combination of the things in what I'm claiming are a basis. So every element of capital X plus capital Y looks like little x plus little y for some little x in x and little y in y. Well, I can now use the fact that I have a basis for x and a basis for y. So that basis for x is a spanning set for x. So my element just here can be written as a linear combination of this basis. So we're just going to do that. We can write x as, well, a linear combination of the z's and the x's. So i equals 1 to k, let's say ai times zi plus the sum from i equals 1 to l of bi times xi. And of course, we can do the same for y, right? We have a basis z1 up to zk followed by y1 up to ym for y. So we're just going to write this little y in terms of that basis. <coughs> 
So it'll be the sum of some scalar ci times zi plus the sum from i equals 1 up to m of some scalar di times yi. Then let's work out x plus y. So we'll need a new slide to do this. x plus y is equal to the sum of ai zi plus the sum of bi xi plus the sum of ci zi plus the sum of di yi. And we can just gather together the coefficients of the z's here and here. ai plus ci zi plus the sum of the bi xi's plus the sum of the di yi's. Okay, we have written any element of x of capital X plus capital Y as a linear combination of the Z's, the X's, and the Y's. So the set Z1, X1, or the sequence rather, Y1, spans X plus Y. The second part of showing that this sequence is a basis is to prove that it is linearly independent. So we're now going to establish linear independence. To do that, we have to suppose we have a linear combination of those things equal to the zero vector and prove that all the coefficients in that linear combination must be zero. So we will suppose that a linear combination written like this is equal to the zero vector in our vector space. Our job is to prove that all of the scalars a1 up to ak and b1 up to bl and c1 up to cm are zero. In order to do that, let's just move one of these sums onto the other side. So, what can we do now? Well, let's think about what's going on on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. So what you have on the left here is you have an element of y because the z's all belong to x intersect y. In particular, they belong to y. And all of the y's belong to y as well. So on the left-hand side of this equation, you have a linear combination of elements of the subspace y, which is therefore an element of y. On the right-hand side, you've got a linear combination of the x's, which are all elements of the subspace x. So this is in the subspace x. So putting that together, this thing on the left-hand side minus the sum of the bi xi's is an element of x and an element of y. If it's an element of x intersect y, then it can be written 
as a linear combination of the basis elements for x intersect y, which we chose at the start of our proof, in other words, the z's. Just to repeat myself, we've established that the sum of the bi xi's, or minus the sum of the bi xi's, is an element of x intersect y. The z's are a basis for x intersect y, in particular they're a spanning set, so we can write any element of x intersect y, in particular this one, as a linear combination of the z's, and that's what I'm doing here. But look what's happened. The x's and the z's are linearly independent. Remember, they form a basis for x, so they're linearly independent. So in an expression like this, which we can rearrange to say that the sum of the dizis plus the sum of the bixis is equal to 0, is a linear dependence relation on this linearly independent set and therefore all of the scalars must be zero. Okay, fine, so what's happened? Um, let's go back to where we started with our linear dependence relation here. What we've now done has shown that actually the b's were all zero. So that makes it a little bit un unreadable. But what we now know is that these are all zero. But the exact same argument would also say that the c's are zero. So the same argument with y in place of x would show that these c's were all zero. So finally, if we call this star, because all the b's and the c's we know to be zero, it just says that the sum of the a i z i's is equal to the zero vector. But the zi's were a basis for x intersect y. In particular, they are linearly independent. So if they're linearly independent, then all the ai's must be equal to zero. We have shown the b's are zero, the c's are zero, and the a's are zero. So we've finished, and we've proved that our, our sequence really is linearly independent and it's therefore a basis of x plus y.